Thank you for thank you for that kind introduction and um, and for for uh, for having me here. The last time I was in Dublin, I was on a uh, as a student on a on a Guinness infested long weekend. So I can't remember. I I, rem <laughs> I can't say I remember a lot. But I've been to Ireland many times, especially with Cork, where we collaborate with. So I was asked to um, and it, and I think that the previous speakers did a great job introducing the subject and and um, my, I was asked to go a little bit into more detail how we're going to use this in clinical practice and I'm going to focus on that. Um, I'm not sure if it's needed but uh, uh, better safe than sorry disclosure we do work with a lot of companies um, and get funding from them as well. So I'm first going to talk about why did I come out of bed this morning through the rain like you, right? What's the rationale for this work? Um, uh, what about the data and how can we uh, get people better? So that's the, the three-part uh, thing. The rationale. Well, being from Holland, um, I always start uh, my talks with tulips um, because, you know, you have to... Uh, yeah, that's, you know, that's what people think we have. Or we don't have tulip in Maastricht, right? We did get the euro, uh, but no tulips. Um, but suppose you are a tulip farmer in Holland and you've bought two types of tulips. You've bought pink tulips and you've bought yellow tulips. And you have those two crates, but you hire a student to help with you in the summer and a student drops two crates. Right? Now your tulip bulbs are across your farm, but the problem with tulips is you can't see on the outside of a bulb what color it will become. That's why you get you know, a package with a, you know, with a picture on it. And so you're now faced with a problem as a farmer because you know half of them are white, uh, yellow, you know half of them are pink, but you really want your field to look like on the left-hand side, so that they're perfectly separated into two because then you can you know, cut your flowers and sell pink and, and yellow bouquets to the Tesco. You don't want your field to look like on the right-hand side because that's a lot of sorting, right? But there are your bulbs on the, on the farm and you, so you ask a tulip expert. Tulip expert, come and help me sort this out, right? And you ask the expert, well, Pick a bulb, and if you're sure this one is going to be pink, put them on the left-hand side of your field. And if you're sure it's going to be yellow, put them on the right-hand side, and put the one you're unsure about in the middle. It's called an ordering experiment. And you can put a, a, a number on that, and that's the accuracy of such prediction, and it's called area on the curve. So if you have found a perfect expert that can predict outcomes of tulips, then the area on the curve is one, perfect prediction. If you're like me, I know nothing about tulips, I buy them for my wife sometimes, but that's it. It will be like the bottom, 0 0.5. Yeah? And if you're you know, somewhat uh, of an expert, there's some signal there, you see 0.72, there's more yellow on the right-hand side, more pink on the left-hand side, but it's not perfect. I do this to explain the problem of predictions and what metric we use to, to see what predictions are. But at my clinic, we don't grow tulips, uh, we treat lung cancer patients. But we asked the same question in non-small cell lung cancer patients from our physicians. We, we gave them a stack of charts, and later we did this electronically, but a stack of charts, where they had to look through the whole chart, and uh, they knew everything about that patient until the treatment was started. Right? And then they had to predict, will this patient be alive in two years? If you're sure the patient is going to be dead, put them on the left-hand side of the table. If you're sure the patient is going to be alive, put them on the right-hand side, put one unsure about in the middle. So again, these doctors know that, let's say, 50% of their patients live or die. Right? That's what literature says. But that's not the question. The question is individually, do you think this patient will live or die? So where do you think our doctors are when we ask them this? Who thinks Maastricht doctors can do this perfectly, that they have an error in the curve of one? Nobody, right? Who thinks they're you know, like in the middle, that they have some, some decent, you know, they can do this reasonably well, one, two, three, Four, five, six, oh, quite a bit, yeah. Who thinks they're total rubbish? <laughs> all right, and these are all the nurses, right? <laughs> <laughs> but um, as always, uh, you know, um, nurses have it right. 0.56, and if you put a confidence interval around that prediction, 0.5 is in that confidence interval. This means that the doctors in my clinic are no better than tossing a coin in predicting outcomes of lung cancer patients. You might say, ah, Dutch, you know, that's just bad education, right? Uh, we have bad doctors and, uh, and so, uh, uh, but Stanford found the same thing, right? In palliative patients, they couldn't predict outcomes as well. They were too optimistic. And this just doesn't hold just for survival, it also holds for toxicities and, um, and other uh, uh, things. This was done in 160 patients, it was a prospective study in five MDs. There were people that just came out of med school and there were people with 20 years of experience, 
didn't matter. Equally bad. Experience doesn't count. And so we are, this is the reason why we started this work about a decade ago, that we said, whoa, we find this unacceptable. Right? Because if a patient comes into our clinic, one of the questions that they have, will I be alive in two years? That's an important question. If we can't answer that question, then saying, you know, toss a coin, that's not a good answer, not a good enough. But perhaps more importantly, if we don't know what the outcome of treatment A is and the outcome of treatment B, how do we know which treatment is best? If we can't predict the outcome of a treatment, how do we know that we do a good job as a hospital, that we have quality? If we don't know the outcomes of treatment, how do we know which ones to improve? Right? So the lack of predictability of healthcare is for us the reason to start it. So we didn't, we didn't start with the data, we started with the problem that we face. Why is that? Why is it that doctors cannot predict outcomes? Well, um, it was said that uh, you know, doctors have big brains. They do, perhaps, but uh, they can do five things. Uh, so when you have to make a prediction or you want to do a task, you can take five things into account in your mind. If you need to consider more than five factors in making a decision, you start making mistakes. That's just a human thing, doctors included. That's your cognitive capacity. But the problem is that doctors see way more factors on patients, right? You see here the, the growth, the explosion of data over the years, and this is due to imaging and genomics, but also lots of clinical and lab and all that stuff, right? So that's the first problem. It's an explosion of data. The second problem is an explosion of decisions. Doctors need to make more, or patients and doctors together need to make more and more decisions than ever. Breast cancer used to be one disease, now it's eight. And you all have different treatments, right? Prostate cancer, there must be five or six treatments who are equally good but um, um, you have a slightly different toxicity profile and you have to decide. So that's the second problem. The third is, and that's the assumption, perhaps this assumption of health, the Health Research Board or in general, is that on the, on the crossroads of what we know about the patients and the decisions we might take, that we look up the guideline or that we open up literature and see what's best. Well, if you want to keep up with literature and radiotherapy and lung cancer, you have to read about eight hours per day every day of the year. That's not possible, right? But the second thing is that what's in literature is extremely biased, right? Cancer patients, generally 3% of cancer patients are in clinical trials, and they're usually young white females, right? Which means that the patient sitting in front of you, an 80-year-old still smoking, man with COPD, that you have to make a decision on, is never in a trial cohort. And so there's very little information on that. So it's extremely biased. And then in my field, I, we do a, a radiation of cancer patients. And it's a very technology-heavy field. And we introduce technology because it's a sharper knife. Why, we, why do we buy the newest Philips CT scanner? Because it's the newest CT scanner, it has better images. That might be true, but we don't know about how much. And uh, proton therapy, similar situation in my field. And so, when the British Medical Journal took 3,000 treatments out of medicine, and look, what's the evidence here of evidence-based medicine? Um, in a third of the cases, so that's the top right, in a third of the cases, we have evidence that the treatments work. In one-sixth of the cases, which is the right bottom, we have evidence that the treatment does not work, but we do them nonetheless. In half, and in half of the cases of the treatments in medicine, we don't have evidence. And so when you see this picture, you understand that making decisions in medicine is not a human task. The medical director of Maastricht Clinic, my clinic, has said it is unethical that we're asking doctors to make decisions in medicine. He is a doctor himself, right? That's the problem we're facing. So where do we want to go? What's the, what's the solution here? Well, we want to go into a, to a different type of medicine. We just, we want to complement replace, complement evidence-based medicine, which is coming from the top left there, clinical trials and guidelines, phase one, two, three, four, and so on, um, with a data-driven approach. And the data-driven approach is, it starts with um, that in every hospital in the world, we collect uh, treatment data, and outcome data, and patient data. And can we learn something from that? Can we aggregate that? Can we extract knowledge from that? Can we then apply that knowledge in the next patient and see, do something different? Right? And can we then see what happened to that patient? We have a new data point, and can we have that circle running in every hospital in the world uh, instead of solely relying on what we do now, which is evidence-based medicine? Can we have that circle running in 24 hours? Can we have that circle running real time? Those are the questions that we ask ourselves. So that's the rationale. But this, this uh, requires data. And so here's a picture of the cancer data. 
And um, suppose you're looking at this decade, so 2005, 2015, maybe that's your interesting cohort, there are about 140 million cancer patients in the world. That's it, right? That's how many got cancer. Suppose you collect about 100 megabyte to 10 gigs, we collect about 10 gigs, of course, in different parts of the world, we be less. The total data set on cancer is about 14 to 1400 petabytes of data. Let's say, you know, 100 petabytes. Is that a lot? No. That's fine. That's not big. CERN has three times as much data, right, on their uh, collider in Geneva. Google has certainly an order of magnitude more data. We don't know how much. It's a, it's a company secret. We have to guess from the energy that they use. Right? But we know it's an order of magnitude more than this. So the side of the data, the volume is not the issue. What there is a little bit of an issue, and, um, and the previous speaker also showed this graph, is that lots of the data is unstructured, right? It's in free text, it's in images. Those are the big data sets, so yellow is images and um, green is EMR. Um, but there's lots of ways nowadays, technology is coming up to get structure out of data. We already talked about deep learning, that's a way to do it. We talked to Siri, you know, you get recognized faces in, the, in pictures. All these things uh, really are about creating structure out of unstructured data. So help us on the way. So what's the real problem then? The real problem is this, that that data is spread around 100,000 hospitals in the world, and we can't get access to it. And this is just the hospital, as Joe already said, you know, and when you talk about patients and you know, wearables and all that, that will explode even more. But suppose we just want to learn from hospital data. So the problem of big data is not the volume, the problem is not the unstructuredness, I don't worry about that, of those things, the problem is 100,000 pockets. So if you, if you, and this was already, some people said this as well, so suppose I send an Excel sheet to Shanghai and said, oh, you know, fill in this Excel sheet for me with your data. What answer do I get? The first answer I get is, I don't have the resources. We have to get a grant, you know, I don't have time to capture that, I certainly don't have time to you know, type over my EHR in your Excel sheet, Andre, uh, it's just too much work. That's answer one. Answer two is, I don't want you to have my data, because I want to publish on my own data. Or if you find out that I'm doing something bad, maybe my patients will go to the next hospital, or I have a PR risk. Right? That's the political argument. Then there's the ethical legal argument, says I'm not allowed to. The previous speaker said this as well. If people say this, what they really mean is they don't have the resources or they don't want to. Because in every legal system in the world, there's a way to share data. You may perhaps have to ask consent or you have to de-identify or you have to, you know, security and all that stuff. It's just resources and will, right? It is possible. And the GDPR is certainly possible in terms of research, it actually is much clearer than it was before. To us. Technically sharing data, you know, sharing Netflix movies and that stuff, it's also easy. And technically there's not a real challenge in this. Right? So that's not the issue. But when we started this work about a decade ago, we looked at these barriers and said, well, we, how can we get all the data in the world? That was the question that we have. Well, if you want to get all the data in the world and you want to have all these barriers, then you have to have a way of not sharing the data. So if sharing is the problem, then don't. Think of an infrastructure where nobody needs to share their data. But you only have a mountain and Muhammad problem, right? Because if, you, if, the, if, 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 if the mountain doesn't come to Muhammad, Muhammad has to go to the mountain. And, um, and that, so you have to, if the, if, the, if the data cannot come all to Maastricht for the researchers, we have to move the research to the data. In the beginning, and that's why the list is so long, we traveled quite a bit. All researchers went to all these sites and analyzed their data. Right? But that doesn't really scale. So, but if you can't bring the data to research, you have to bring the research to the data. What does that mean? Well, it means that, first of all, you have to package your research question, like, you know, learn a survival model for lung cancer, or that's a research question. You have to package that somehow and send it to someone else. Right, that's an application, that's software. You can, you know, R or SPSS, so you, you, I think if you, you work in research, you have plenty of tools that can do that. So you have to package that and be able to send it somewhere else. That's becoming very easy nowadays. And we call them trains. But when I send a research application to, to Cork, and Cork starts running that, you know, executable, to, to starting it, and it starts analyzing the data in Cork and messaging with the, uh, you know, with Holland, 
all the IT will be very nervous because that's a virus, right? It's a, it's a thing that you don't know what it does. It starts processing in your, in your IT department and communicating with the outside world. So you need a lot of security, right? And you need a lot of knowledge about what does that application do, what data does it request, logging, and so forth. So we call this track, right? Somebody has to monitor the track. These two things are relatively easy. The real hard thing is this. If I send my little train to Shanghai, that train doesn't speak Chinese. And so the Chinese have to put their data into their station in a way that the train can not only read the data, but also understand the data. Because I don't have the luxury now of a human looking at the data. So the data has to be in a state what we nowadays call FAIR, right? Since a year, this is now called FAIR data, findable, accessible, and interoperable, reusable. That means that data can be understood by machines and not just by humans. And that's what we're working on. Now, this is called the personal health train, and we're working uh, globally on this, uh, you know, with, with different, different aspects of the problem. And I'm going to show you a little movie about how we are now going to go about this in the Netherlands to connect everyone to each other is the idea. And that's called the personal health train. So we have an animation with sound, hopefully. The personal health train's main goal is connecting health data to make them more usable. Personal health management requires increasing amounts of personal data. But today, this information cannot easily be used because the data are produced and managed by various healthcare providers, authorities, and more and more by citizens themselves. These stakeholders collect and manage their data in different ways, making the data hard to find and use. Furthermore, personal medical information is very privacy sensitive. As a consequence, personal health data cannot be used easily by citizens themselves, by physicians and by researchers. The personal health train goes to the root of this problem by building fair data stations. FAIR protocols ensure that data are findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. These data stations are connected by tracks, which are strictly secured and protected. FAIR data trains are constantly monitored and only trains with the appropriate validation may enter a particular station. To secure privacy, every data station has rules. Each data owner has access to his or her secured station and can easily request and control one's personal information. In addition, the owner can set rules for who can access the data and how it may be used. Communities with common interests, like patient societies, can choose to connect and organize their information through umbrella stations. With this access, a researcher can learn, for example, which cancer patients benefit most from novel therapies such as proton therapy. Or a citizen with a specific variant in his genome can be automatically alerted when new research results, insights, or possible risks become available. In this approach, the information is accessible for research, prevention and education without the data ever leaving the station. With the personal health train, health data becomes available whilst individuals and institutions maintain control. So this is... Um we're trying to build in the Netherlands. This is a movie uh, of an animation of 2015. And uh, we did it in, in the, for a grant, because I'm a researcher, right? We write grants. And it was totally burned down by the grant agency. Rubbish idea, you know, can never work, will not do. Um, 10 days ago, the government in the health ministry in Holland said, the personal health train is the way we're gonna do this in the Netherlands, right? Because it is the best way to start reusing some of the data, as the previous speaker said, for um, um, uh, useful um, healthcare research, but also healthcare, having people can take control of their own data, using their own data for their own goods, you know, like citizen science or you know, change lifestyles, and so forth and so forth. So this is now taking off, and not only in Holland, but also in Germany and Switzerland and Belgium and so forth. Right. So <clears throat> um, what are we doing with this in, in 
clinical practice, right? So I, I took some examples of the work that we've done so far with such infrastructure and data and how that may improve your um, healthcare. And I think it's important to separate two main improvements, right? Uh, this is the, our big machine, and on the left hand there's, you know, capture data ever, big data. A lot of the data is still unusable, so it kind of is dumped there, right? But there's some, and of course one of the goals of us is to improve, you know, the amount of data that we can actually use. But some of that can already be used and thrown into this big machine. Maybe it's a mill, right? A steel mill. And um, it looks a little bit like a steel mill, I guess, right? Yeah. And, uh, and, but you can then use the data for two things, right? One of them is... I guess efficiency, automation, better care processes, right? And already some examples were made um, uh, in that. But we're really interested, and if you know the rationale, we're really interested in changing patient outcomes and predicting outcomes. And we're also going to talk a little bit about that and how we feel that should, um, should work. So better cancer processes, well, in my field, so irradiate, for instance, lung cancer patients, and then the problem with radiation, so lung ca cancer is somewhere in the middle, but the problem with radiation is you have to go through the normal lung and the normal heart to reach the tumor with your radiation. And um, the, the heart and the lung and other organs, uh, you know, they don't like that, obviously, you got toxicities. And it's important for us to, in the field to delineate all the organs in the body so that we can calculate how much dose is delivered to that organ so we can estimate toxicities and risks. Right. So this is what a, what a radiation oncologist does every day uh, of his career, you know, drawing normal tissues. It takes about, you know, depending on the site, a couple of hours. On the middle you see a Turing test, where you have an AI draw those contours. And uh, what you see, so we, the, 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 the people were presented with a contour and they had to guess, was this made by a human or by a machine? Right? And the answer is they can no longer separate the two. So the machine has become so good that, um, that it is uh, much like the dermatology and the radiology, it is imitating a human. Then they were asked, you know, they had two contours, one of a clinician and one of uh, the machine, the AI, and they had to determine, you know, which one of those do you prefer? And you can see that the deep learning, DL, so the deep learning, so AI-based contouring, is almost at par with physician preference. And then they were uh, shown a contour and, and said, do you find this clinical acceptable right, to use? And you see that in 70% of the cases, they find the deep learning contour clinical acceptable. But that's also true for their own contours. Right? Doctors delineate something, and two months later, you see the contour, I say it's rubbish. Right? So they also don't accept their own contours always, 100%. So you can see this is very close. Very close, and there's now you know, FDA approved, and this will come to our field. Um, will this uh, replace radiation oncologists? Yes. Yes, right? Is that a bad thing? No, because you know, if we go on this track, about one in four Dutch people will work in healthcare in 10 years, right? So we need less people in healthcare, not more, right? So I totally agree with uh, Joel about radiologists. We have to think about this, a little, you know, not just from the doctor's standpoint, but from society standpoint as well. Is it perfect? Um, no, this is a liver delineation, this is pretty good, but this, this, this AI was trained on patients which were only scanned on their back in the CT, right? And if you give it a scan of a patient which is scanned with the uh, prone, with their you know, tummy down, um, it starts making mistakes. And you see here the, the red is what the deep learning said and the blue is, um, is what should be. And you know, this is just to show an AI is only as stupid or as good as the data that you give it. Right? And if you give it for something it has never seen, like a brain scan, it will give you a liver. So you have to be a bit careful with AIs in terms of you know, how do you implement it, how do you commission, how do you make sure it doesn't see um, things that it shouldn't see. Um, does an AI have to be perfect? Well, here on the left-hand side, you see Greek people playing around uh, with a self-driving car, and they've made this little circle so the car can go in, but then the self-driving car says, ooh, that's, you know, that's a li solid line I can't cross, and it stays there, because it's never seen that. Right? So you have to get in to get it out. Um, but this is typical, so AIs will not be perfect, but they don't have to be. Right? You want them to be better than doctors, or equal to doctors, because then you can automate them. They don't have to be better. But because you know, the benefit of AIs is obviously that they are never tired, and they don't drink, and they, don't, you know, they, they, um, they, um, they are consistent. Right? And the most important thing to consider when you want to have an AI is, does it really save me time? And this is what we did. So this contouring bit of, uh, of lungs and esophagus, spinal cord, heart, mediastinum, and then on the right-hand side is all. And you can see that the reduction in time is about 60%. So instead of uh, four hours, it only uh, takes less than, uh, it's, it's, it's much less, hours less, and it saves a lot of time. Of course, you sometimes still have to correct them. That's why it's not zero. But that zero will be met 
in due time. Because as already was explained by someone, AI is generally, the more data you give it, the better they become, and they will become better. In now we're through so that processes. It's interesting, you know, efficiency and so on. Uh, and I agree that we have to look at that. But of course, we're more interested in outcomes. How can we do outcomes? Uh, use this here. So this is an example of my field where we treat patients with proton therapy. Uh, and proton therapy, why is it better than classical radiation therapy? Is because protons here see brain cancer, and this is classical radiotherapy. This is proton radiotherapy. In classical radiotherapy, you can see this beam which comes from this side poof, go through the whole brain and irradiates a large piece of the brain there, and that gives toxicities, cognitive problems, uh, fatigue, and so forth. The benefit of protons is that they stop, right? So this whole part of the brain is uh, is is not radiated, but. Um, we have in Holland about 50,000 patients every year that get radiation, but we only have 1,600 proton slots, right, because they're very expensive to build and complicated. And we don't have evidence. Why don't we have evidence of proton therapy? Because you first have to build the machines before you can get evidence. So this is typically technology that you can't trial because you first have to build it. So who gets it? That's the question. And we, um, we agreed with the government that the computer will say this, right? So uh, you will be fed. Um, into a computer, your data, your clinical information, you know, your photon plan, your proton plan, and they will be compared, and here in the middle is something called toxicity, uh, and that's where the AI uh, plays a role. So that's an AI-based, a model-based toxicity prediction. And basically, only those patients in which we see a really big uh, reduction in toxicity are allowed to be sent to proton therapy. Otherwise, you cannot be treated, not with all the money in the world you have. Well, you can go to the US, obviously, that's always possible, but yeah. Computer says no, or computer says yes. Right? First time technology is introduced on model-based indications. So that's for us a really big opportunity. And of course, you, we can only build these proton centers. All that data is then fed back, so that we can start having this cycle and improve the models and make sure that you know, the patient who really need proton therapy will be fed more and more to the system in a, in a targeted way. That's the idea. Um, in clinical decision support, so this is a, a picture of our EHR, uh, we use it in the clinic, right? And this is an example. Um, what we do here is, so there are six factors that are in Dutch, but uh, this is a lung cancer patient, and we can predict what is your chance that you will live longer than half a year? And in this case, it's 53%. Right? Um, so that's individualized prediction based on AI-based models. Um, and why, how do we use it? Well, if you only have very short to live, the question is, do you still want that therapy, right? Do you still want to be irradiated on your head for, you know, possible brain metastasis? If that only, you know, that's, that's going to take you two months in the hospital, but you're only going to live six months, so do you really want that, right? Are you still, or you know, if you live a long time, perhaps you want more. So you can use this in the clinic, and it is being used in our clinic, to have that conversation with the patient. Right? Do you still want all that, if this is the prediction? Uh, the final, um, oh no, sorry, yes, uh, yeah, so, so what we also want is that these things, be, you know, they can do it by themselves, the doctor. So what you see here is a doctor um, defining a certain group, so he's looking for elderly patients between uh, 65 and older with a certain TNM staging, because this is a, there's a patient sitting in front of him, and he wants to know, you know, I want to model now learned from the data in the world uh, where I can determine survival. And so you see him, uh, you know, pressing that, uh, you know, and he wants survival. And then what happens on the back end is that two trains are being sent out. One is sent to Rome, and one is sent to Maastricht. And they learn, you know, a model on the spot, uh, a prediction model on the spot, given the criteria of that patient. And then that's been sent back to the, to the doctor, so that the doctor, together with the patient, can use that in the clinic. It's not real time, but it's in two minutes. It's very close, right? And so this is great because now the model is, you can load that model that you just learned, you fill in the specific variables of the patient, and you get a kepler meyer curve. So this is how we're trying to get AI in the hands of doctors and have them you know, play around with it and, um, and use it to their benefit. Okay. Finally, how do we then save lives? You know, that of course, in the cancer clinic, we are always concerned with lives and lung cancer. is one of those diseases where we still have a long way to go. Um, and I'm gonna show you an example with Australia. That's the final example. So in lung cancer, you can have this palette of treatments. And what this means is you can get uh, you know, palliative radiotherapy, which is a low dose, is on the top or uh, bottom left. And you can give a high dose of radiotherapy, or you can combine it with chemo, and so forth. And you can escalate that. What this means is you get more survival, but also more toxicity, and thereby less quality of life. Right? That's, uh, that's the consequence. 
In Holland, we give 100% of people a high dose. Why? Because it is the guideline. In Australia, they don't do that. They give half of the people a low dose of radiotherapy. And now the question is, did these Australians do a good job in selecting those patients that got palliative therapy? If you know something about the predictive capability of doctors, you kind of are worried now, and you should. Uh, and I'm going to show you. So we have this model that can predict you know, what would be the survival be if you give them a high dose. And we're going to see what the model says. So these are the survival of the patient treated in Australia with a low dose of radiotherapy. And um, so you, know, you see that about 20% uh, is alive at two years. Right? But you can also see there's you know, this black line in there, and that's the patients that our model says has a, have a good prognosis if they would have given them a high dose of radiotherapy. Right? And now you can estimate what would have been the survival in those you know, uh, solid line patients if they would have not received a low dose, but if the Australians would have given them a high dose. And the overall survival would have jumped from about 20% to 60%. Three times increase in overall survival. Just by making better choices in the treatments that you already have. This is not, you know, it's a huge increase, but it is making better choices in, the, in those patients. So the Australians can now use this, right? What they hardly do is they use the model and they say, if it's a good prognosis, we're going to do everything we can to get the dose in. And that's changing practice and changing lives. You might think that the Australians are doing a bad job. And to some extent, um, that's true. But when I saw this chart, I was more ashamed of Holland. And this is, and the problem is this, right? These are the patients in Holland, in the whole of Holland, which is my clinic, that get concurrent chemoradiation. The uh, median survival of those patients is about six months. Of those six months, we make them two months sick as hell, and we spend a lot of money on treating them. Right? What is the benefit compared to the Australians that only give you know, a one or two day schedule and the patient goes home? The survival benefit is zero. So we are massively over-treating a quarter of our patients and making their last six months miserable at high cost. Right? And this is the message. When you start sharing data, you always learn both. Right? There's no, you know, you do it bad, we, do, we all do it bad and we could do better. And by sharing data and having that diversity in your data, that's a good thing and you can learn something from that. So that's my final example. Um, and we do a lot of other things, uh, you know, not just in cancer, but also, you know, more s s policy-driven or, you know, uh, physiotherapy and uh, bowel disease. But uh, you know, I had to select, the, I selected the cancer cases. And uh, as said, we do work with a lot of centers. And hopefully, you understand why that is. It's not just, you know, uh, name dropping. We do actually try to get uh, stuff done with them. And I thank you uh, for your attention. <laughs>